Hello and welcome to my London's Calling 2021 session, locking it down and opening it up. No, this is not a reference to the lockdown we're still in here in the UK, um, but instead to Salesforce security and data access. But let me first introduce myself. My name is Louise Lockie and I'm actually and happily one of the organisers of this here event. But when I'm not busy helping to get this show on the road, um, I do actually have a few other things that occupy my time. My day job is as a freelance consultant and instructor. Um, but outside of that, I'm also a Salesforce MVP five times as of this month. I lead the London Women in Tech group. I'm a platform champion, have 14 certifications and yes, a golden hoodie. Here I am with Parker Harris, CTO and co-founder of Salesforce. In the pre-COVID world, I enjoyed travelling and I've been lucky enough to um, present on some of the biggest stages in the Salesforce ecosystem, um, as you can see here from some of the logos. Anyway, enough about me. We're here to get the lowdown on Salesforce security and data access. And believe it or not, this is the kind of subject which gets my attention. It actually excites me. And I'm hoping and I have a feeling that I'm not alone in this. So let's cover the agenda. First of all, we're going to talk about why we should lock down our Salesforce orgs, why it's important, um, and why we should be doing it as both admins, but also as consultants with our clients' orgs. We're going to talk briefly about org access, but then the two main areas we're going to talk about can be field access and record access, two different things. And in my experience, where a lot of people get mixed up, myself included at times. Agenda item one, why should we give careful consideration to our data access model? Well, as admins, we're responsible for ensuring our users see the fields and the records they need and no more. And yeah, you may well say um, all my users are employees. They're under contract. They may even sign, signed an NDA. Um, you might say, well, there's no risk to them having access in our CRM. But this isn't about an admin on a power trip. It's not, not about your name's not down, you're not coming in. Um, this is about having and giving the right level of access to our users to do their job. And in actual fact, this is a well-established concept in the, um, in the system and, and software development world. It is named the principle of least privilege. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of it. It was coined first, the internet tells me, by Jerome Seltzer. And he is attributed with this quote, every program and every privileged user of the system should operate using the least amount of privilege necessary to complete the job. So what does that mean to us in our Salesforce world? Well, it should mean that we regularly consider who needs to see which records and which fields. And to my mind, there's two drivers for this. One is data security. By now, we all know enough about GDPR to know that we have to be able to prove that we've established not only um, our good data models, our good data practices, but that only the people that need to have access to PII have it. So yes, if we store payment information, say, um, though we may trust our colleagues implicitly, if the ICO, the Inter Information Commissioner's Office, comes a calling, we still need to be able to show that we have considered and given them access based on the need for it, based on information, and not just because it was easier to click at all when we created the new field. Yes, I know some of you are saying that sounds familiar. The other point to consider is we need to avoid a bad user experience. This guy here doesn't look too happy. And it may well because he's looking at page layout, which looks like it's been created by a child or my hoarder auntie, <laughs> all the fields. If you can see all the fields, then perhaps you can't see the wood for the trees and you might still get calluses on your scrolling finger. 
If you can see all the records, then your reports, the list views, search results, they're going to all too often surface too many results to be usable. That's no fun for anyone, and we don't want to be head in hands like this guy. So generally, what I'm saying is less of this, please. Anyone click guilty of clicking this box? To my mind, the only time you click that box is because it highlights them all, then you unclick and it unhighlights them all, unselects them all. That's its use case in my book. Let's face it. Is there ever a field that needs to be added and granted to every single profile? I think I heard someone say yes there. I'm looking to check in the chat later. Um, but I challenge that person. What about the out of the box standard profiles? We shouldn't be using those. Best practice is that they're there to be cloned, not to be used, not to be assigned. Um, we'd be given this new field um, all of those profiles access to this new field. What about the minimum access standard profile we now all have access to? It, it's, it's suddenly redundant and useless if we click that box and the, those fields are added to that profile each time. Totally negates its purpose. Finally, the other thing I always consider is most businesses, most orgs I know, have an, an API only profile, an integration profile. And that is very important that that's kept like basically empty bar API only. If you then it inherits the permissions because you've been ticking that box a bit too much, you could be giving integrations, which means potentially third parties, access to fields um, that they shouldn't have access to. And of course that could mean records as well. So if you've listened to me, number one takeaway, do not do this, do not tick that box. Wondering how many confessions I'm seeing in the chat right about now. So we've got to find a balance. We don't want to be one or too much one way or too much the other. But we do have to consider how much access and to whom we are giving whenever we're, we're developing in our system. Because on one side, yes, we've got the ICO, we've got um, potentially opening up our orgs to too much um, exposure that could, be, uh, could mean a hacker or cybersecurity issue. And on the other side, we've got that pesky insufficient privileges error. We've all seen it. Nine times out of 10, it's legitimate. There's a reason why that person shouldn't see um, what they're seeing and they should see the insufficient privileges error. But we don't want to lock it down too much. They need to see what they need to see. Um, and we want to avoid that. The other thing to consider on that side of the balance is that this is more work. We do these, these things properly, it's more work for us, which does mean less time with our feet up, fluffy slippers included in front of the fire. <laughs> if only, eh? So we'll touch on this briefly, um, but we're not going to dig into it. Super straightforward, org access. We know what we need to have access to to get into an org. We, it needs to be a user. Even if it's an integration user, an API user, a user must exist with a license, a license that grants some access. And we know that that comes with a username and password. Now, of course, we can restrict when and we can restrict from where users can log in. But essentially, a license and login details gets them in. Bear in mind from, from where, check out the login IP ranges as, as an example. And from the when, check out the, um, the login hours. Bear in mind, I'm going to circle back to that integration user. We really do want to make sure that they are API only, which means that the where from then also for from them also um, means that they can't log in via the browser. They can only log in via an API. I think that is important. Now, security is a whole big issue. Um, I believe we have a, um, a session on the agenda today, which is about MFA. Um, it's a very hot topic at the moment, but I'm not covering that today. Uh, you know, go find that other session, um, look that one up, um, look at it there. But um, today we're moving on to field and record access. And I think this is the number one thing um, to get straight. Get that straight first before moving on to the rest of it. It's the difference between 
field and record access and how then both are shared because they're both are shared in different ways. So the field is the website field on the account, the mobile field on contact or a unique identifier, auto number on quite frankly any object. Remembering that we're talking about the shell here, not the data within it. That's what we're granting access to. When we come to the record, then we're looking at, well, London's calling record, the data. So the website address, the mobile number, and the opportunity number. So this is what we're talking about, the difference between seeing the shell of the field and seeing the actual data within it. So starting with field access. And the first thing is to, to touch on, first things first, all of this is obsolete if we don't have object access. So let's always assume object access, meaning if you don't have at least read access to the object in question, so accounts, contacts, opportunities, then having access to the fields on said object is irrelevant, pointless, doesn't get you anywhere. So assuming um, ob object access, easy for me to say, we grant field access on the profile or on the permission set. Quick 101, admins basics. Um, each user has just one profile, but they can have many permission sets. So we're going to quickly look at how we um, assign this access in a profile or in a permission set. Now, as you know, it's pretty much the same process. We go to the object in question. We can then establish that we have read access. We then find the field in question and we tick the box, making sure that they have access to the website. Nice. That's it on a profile. But on a permission set, it's the same. Here we have a permission set. We'll go to object settings. We're going to scroll down and find opportunity. And when we find it, I'm wondering why I picked O. We then can make sure we have read access on the opportunity. We're probably going to want create an edit as well, but not delete. And then we go down and we find the opportunity number, our auto number, our replacement for the long 18 digit Salesforce ID. And we give permission that way. Easy, profile permission set. How else can we grant access to the field? Well, field level security, the hints in the name. Um, and we can do this on a field by field basis. So we navigate to the mobile field here in the object manager and tick that box for the profiles. Now, I wish that this page gave us the option to specify not just by profile, but by permission set too. Feels key to me and it's something missing on the journey to using permission sets more widely, i.e. in place of multiple profiles. So I'm very much hoping that this is on the Salesforce roadmap. But this does bring me on to my next point. What we should be moving towards, a permission set led approach. Please, fewer profiles, more permission sets. Now, this is actually something I applied um, and, uh, and recommended for a number of years. But within the last few releases, Salesforce have made it clear that that's the direction they're moving in. And that is now their recommended approach and pretty much official best practice. So I'm really pleased to see that. This means that we should be reviewing our setup and we should be trying to consolidate our profiles down to as few as possible and then differentiate between groups of users um, based on what they need to do, their roles, if you will, without using a confusing term. Um, and we can use permission sets then to grant them this additional granular different access so to paint a scene um, where I've been in the past, I've been in a quite big org that we've managed to have just four profiles. We had just a standard user profile, custom one, but you know, standard that had the baseline permissions that all users that had a full Salesforce license in the company needed. So that was the number one. 
We've of course had the system admin one. I mean, you know, that, that has to be special, that's there. We had an API profile. I've talked about this already for integrations. And then we actually, the fourth was a chatter free user profile for the employees, the, the colleagues that didn't have a full sales or full license. They just had access to chatter. So those were the four. And then all other permissions to differentiate groups of users and levels of access, power users and not um, different teams were managed by permission sets. So for example, um, permission set for granting access to campaigns and the marketing type fields, access to the invoicing screens and the fields associated with, with invoicing with finance, access to delete objects of different kinds, good few of those because you don't just grant someone access to delete anything, you know, they need to delete accounts because they're having a tidy up, they can have that permission. They need to delete opportunities because they're looking for dupes there, they can have that permission, not a mass one. The ability to change an opportunity to close one, that's a good one, because, you know, if you want to have a buffer between your salesperson and person that's saying that sale has been made, then you can use that on a permission set. Um, and the ability to import leads. So you get the idea. And you might be thinking, oh, blimey, Louise, I've got a lot of profiles on my in my org. Well, Salesforce is getting ahead of us um, and it has released on the App Exchange. So a free app by Salesforce Labs called Permission Helper App. Basically, you can go into it, you install it into your org, you pick the profile that you want to convert into a permission set. It will take all the permissions from that and put them on the permission set. OK. Um, just to highlight that, unfortunately, we're not getting rid of profiles immediately or, or potentially anytime soon. Salesforce doesn't close things that quickly at all. Um, so bear in mind that you've seen these screens. Login hours, IP ranges, just by profile at the moment, really need not to be uh, very frustrating, but that's, that is what it is. Um, and the other is you know, another familiar screen to us, assigning a record page layout um, that, you know, that still uses profiles quite heavily. So they're not going away, but just be mindful of what can and can't be on a permission set, and most of it can. Now, I promised to mention permission set groups. They're on the agenda, they were in the abstract, and here they are, saving admins clicks since 2019. And though I joke, <laughs> that is essentially all they do. They save clicks, not to be um, discounted, you know, so clicks take time, but um, if you regularly grant the same permissions together, um, then permission sets groups can mean that you add one permission set group, a collection of permission sets, rather than adding one permission set after another. It can help you do it quicker. I'm not sold on them. I'm not sure what they bring to the table, much more than what we had and saving clicks, but let's use them when we have use cases for them. Now, record access. As a reminder, this is the, the data. So we're now looking at the London's calling record. And in this case, in this example, it's website address. So how do we grant record access? Quite a few different ways, in fact. So let's work through the, these. The first one to think of, do they own the record? If they own the record, they can access the record. Ownership is key. Now, what is the org word default of the object? That will determine who can see what records on that object. Remember that the org wide default is determined on an object by object basis. It's set on an object by object basis. Is it owned by someone below them in the role hierarchy? That way you can share access. Has it been shared with them via sharing rules? Love a sharing rule. Have they been added to an account, opportunity or case team for that record? And last, has it been manually shared with them by the owner? So these are you know, most of the declarative ways that we can share records. Now going back to number one, ownership is king. If they own it, they can access it. Simple rule. 
caveat of they've got to have at least read access to that object and of course the field that we're, we're if we're talking about a field um, but 9.9 .9, I'd say time, times out of 10 um, they will have otherwise how's it in their name in the first place if you own something you can see it you can edit it you can share it you can transfer it if it's a lead or a case and if you've got the permission to do so you can delete it so ownership is key. But what else is key? Well, for records you don't own, we've got to think about um, locking it down and opening it up again. That's where I got the name of the title. Uh, so all by default, well, what are the options? Public read write, public read only, and private. Going from the most open to locked down completely. Only owner sees the records. So we've locked it down, say, we've moved our opportunity object from public read write down to private. That's not very good. Only the owner has access to that record. Reporting is rubbish in your company suddenly. So how do we open it up again? Well, the first option, role hierarchy, then sharing rules, and then teams. They, you, know, you don't have to work through them in that order. It's just how they can open it up to the most people in the most strategic way, the least manual. So here is a role hierarchy. Um, now I put a note here that this is not a copy of the org chart. Remember that this should be reflective of your data access model, not your org chart. So normally people shouldn't see it because they might go, oh, I don't report to him. That's not the way it works. Um, this is about access. So the access is shared up. So if a marketing exec owns a record, the marketing director is above them in the role hierarchy, they will gain access to that record by nature of the role hierarchy, as will the CEO. Next up, sharing rules. Have I mentioned that I love a sharing rule? I do. And principally there's two types, but what you need to decide for each of them is what records are you sharing, with whom, and what access are you granting? So we're saying we are sharing the um, all of the opportunities owned by the Eastern sales team. This is on the, the slide on the left hand side, the screenshot. We're sharing the opportunities owned by them. And we are sharing them with the opportunities owned by them. So everyone in the role of Eastern sales team, their opportunities are automatically through this rule shared with the members of the Eastern sales team. So you've there got a team who can edit, and in this case, write as well. Um, sorry, that's the same thing, edit, uh, the, the opportunities of each other. Really handy, standard, something I'd look at for, uh, you know, as soon as I go into a sales team and see they've got a private um, opportunity sharing model. Um, then on the other side, on the left, we have um, the criteria-based sharing rules. And in this example, we have the CFO and their team. They have to have read write access to opportunities once they're one. So here it's a criteria based. We have one equals true and then share it with the role and subordinates of the CFO. It's read write access. Super simple. You just have to work through what logic, how do I identify who, which records I'm sharing? Here, how do I reckon, how do I? work out with whom am I sharing them and then am I giving them read only access or am I giving them read write access and the last one is all about my football team no 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 it's all about teams so of course if you're assigned to an account team you will inherit access to that account and to its opportunities and cases the same in the other way around for opportunities and for cases so teams is another way you can grant access. Now, I have taken my full 25 minutes. I think I've breathed, but I'm not sure. Okay, that was that was a bit of a whirlwind. I can normally cover this in several hours, um, but it is re being recorded and you can re-watch it. So do that. My resources that I suggest to you are on YouTube. Salesforce has a series of videos called Who Sees What? It's even got its own hashtag. 
have a dig of that out. They've updated them a few times over the years, but they are bread and butter. They cover it. They're really useful. So go and have a look at that. It's an important subject to get right. And with that, I say thank you. And I hope to see you all online across the day in the app um, and in the chat. See you next time. <laughs>